Joining me now is Simon Cherry. Simon, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. It's a pleasure. How is it all going so far? It's wonderful to be here back in Perth again after a couple of years and yeah. beautiful location as well. Isn't it? I yes. know. Oh, and we're right by the water right yes. now. Yes. It's lovely. So your plenary is coming up. It is. Very exciting. I, I want you to give me a little sneak peek about it. So you're exploring time and its role in nuclear medicine. What is that all about? <laughs> so, so I chose the theme of time for a couple of reasons. So first of all, I want to pay tribute to some of the people that laid the foundations for our, our field. So I want to look back in time and talk about some of the seminal work that, that led to where we are um, today. Um, but also time is such a fundamental part of nuclear medicine. When we inject our radio traces in, into a patient, the distribution is constantly changing with time. The image you get from one minute to the next is different. And so I want to explore um, how we can use that information and uh, to gain better insight into the underlying biology. And then lastly, I want to go to, to real extremes of time and look at, at detectors that can measure time with a, a precision of less than a billionth of a second, which wow. is what we use in time of flight pet imaging. And we're now moving towards a situation where we can actually directly generate images using the timing information. And I think that's going to be the, the future in terms of the technology. So I want to explore that a little bit as well in the presentation. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. What, what have been some of the historical developments? So, so I think, uh, obviously you start with Marie Curie, probably, um, you, you know, uh, isolating different uh, radionuclides, um, really setting the stage of being able to use radionuclides in practical applications. Following from that, uh, George Hevesy, uh, in the 1920s, you know, using one of those radionuclides led to 12 um, to study its uh, uptake in plants. So that was the first application of a radionuclide to a, a biological system. Mm. He then extended that work into animals. And so that's really the, the basis of the, the tracer kinetic principle, where you put in trace amounts for radioactive material and watch what happens in a living organism first in his case plants and then into animals and of course now we do this in, in humans. And then finally the people that started to develop the, the technology, the imaging technology, so Benedict Casson, um, whom the lecturer that I'm giving tomorrow is named after, um, wow. he really developed the first directional imaging detector and then scanned that across the thyroid to produce the first image um, inside of the, the human body. And then Hal Anger, who, who took that even further to develop the first gamma camera, also called the Anger camera um, in his name. And of course, that was the, the start of imaging technology, which is what my career has been based on. Wow. So those are really the people that I, that I, that I look to for inspiration. Wow, That's, your lecture is going to be fascinating, I have a feeling. <laughs> that, thank you for that sneak peek. Uh, what does nuclear imaging look like right now, if you had to sum it up? Uh, well, we're at a very exciting point, um, as we've seen already in, in some of the, uh, the, the plenary sessions, uh, this uh, uh, revolution in, in, in theranostics, so having diagnostic and therapeutic capabilities, massive uh, growth in the field in that area, very, very exciting. Um, on the technology side, we have incredibly sophisticated technology now, and I really want to um, recognize a lot of the scientists and, and uh, engineers in industry who are often the unsung heroes who develop these incredible machines that are robust and reliable and safe that we use in our hospitals um, every day. But there's still more we can do. Mm. And so I, I think although our imaging machines are, are, are fantastic, we, we can still make them better. So we can, we can see disease earlier, we can quantify disease better. And of course, we'd like to bring the cost down as well. When you talk about the future of nuclear imaging, uh, what does that hold as far as a global picture? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really good question. I, I, I think uh, we need to recognize that the needs for uh, nuclear medicine are going to be different in different parts of the world. So a lot of the focus um, here has been on oncology, for example, but in other parts of the world, infectious disease is probably a much uh, bigger issue. So I, I think expanding the, uh, the reach of nuclear medicine to, to other disease areas that are broadly applicable across, across the, uh, the world and then um, in resource limited uh, uh, areas, you know, it, it's, it's a problem how we get nuclear medicine uh, accessible. It's, mm. it's, it's not the easiest technology to disseminate. So I think yeah. we need some, some clever ideas about how we can make it much more globally accessible. Simon Cherry, thank you so much for breaking it all down for us. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank and good you. Good luck with the plenary. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>